Hello, everyone. Uh, very glad to virtually see you all at the inaugural session of the spring semester's Conflict Security and Development Series. Um, we're incredibly excited to have Thea Rio Francos here, who I will introduce in a second. Um, just want to uh, remind folks that while this week the series is meeting at two o'clock, uh, next week, we'll return to our regular time of uh, 1230 uh, for the series. I want to shout out to our co-sponsors. Um, of course, the series is hosted by the Wagner Office of International Programs, um, and we're very thrilled to collaborate with uh, the School of Professional Studies Center for Global Affairs, the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice, and the Bernstein Institute for Human Rights, both at uh, NYU Law School. Uh, and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences International Relations Program. Um, our speaker today, um, and since this is a webinar format, just to remind people, um, if people would like to use the chat to kind of connect with people and so forth, that's great. Otherwise, if you're gonna have questions that you would like me to raise um, with the, uh, please put that into the Q&A uh, uh, section or Q&A link rather than the chat, that would be great. Um, so Thea Rio Francos is a uh, professor at Providence College. She is, in addition to this book, the co-author of an excellent book on the Global Green New Deal. Um, today, she's going to be talking about uh, resource ra her, her most recent book, Resource Radicals, From Petronationalism to Post-Extractivism in Ecuador. Um, absolutely thrilled to have her. And without further ado, uh, turn it over to Thea. Thanks so much, John, for that warm introduction and to Hannah for initially inviting me and uh, just for everyone for coming out uh, today to this virtual event. So without further ado, I will get started and be sure to leave time for questions and answers. Over the past two decades, two historic processes transformed Latin America. My book, Resource Radicals, is about their intersection and their combined implications for left-wing projects that seek to transform an economic model based on resource extraction. The first process was the recent commodity boom. From roughly 2000 to 2014, demand for primary commodities such as copper, soy, and oil soared, driven in large part by rapid industrialization in China, as well as other emerging economies. During the boom, the price of oil increased almost 500%, accompanied by historically high prices for raw materials across the board. In Latin America, high prices for key exports offer the opportunity of massively increased government revenues, at the same time that they dramatically intensified resource dependency. This renewed economic dependency on oil, mineral, gas, and soy exports coincided with a dramatic political development, what scholars call the pink tide, during which a spate of left-wing governments came to power, beginning with Hugo Chavez in 1999. The coincidence of these two processes transformed the political economy of the region. Ballooning export revenues enabled pink tide administrations to govern from the left, making good on campaign promises to reverse austerity and significantly reduce poverty and inequality, increasing access to education and healthcare and embarking on new infrastructural projects. But the price for improving millions of citizens' socioeconomic well-being was further fiscal dependency on natural resources and, in many cases, the territorial expansion of the extractive frontier subjecting indigenous communities to displacement and fragile ecosystems to contamination. In other words, economic development threatened the well-being of some of these leftist government's core constituencies. The same social groups who had mobilized against the prior decades of neoliberal policies now faced a new set of social and environmental ills. In this context, resource extraction and mega development projects emerge as salient sites of conflict between pink tide administrations and social movements. Resource radicals traces these dynamics in Ecuador. The decade in which leftist Rafael Correa served as president was marked by protracted dispute over new mining and oil projects. The conflict split the Ecuadorian left in two, 
On one side, indigenous and environmental movements claim that resource dependency pollutes the environment, violates collective rights, and undermines democracy. They call this model of development extractivism, or extractivismo in Spanish, and fought for what they called a post-extractive future. This stance represented a historic shift. Just years earlier, some of these same social movements had fought for the nationalization of natural resources. They now resisted all forms of resource extraction, no matter who the owner. On the other side, the Korea administration defended a pro-extraction stance, asserting that oil and mining are vital for equitable economic development. They argued that this development would benefit the majority, strengthen the state, and bolster democracy. Benefits that in their view far outweighed the socio-environmental costs of mining or oil. And I just want to turn to these photographs um, on the screen right now. So you have sort of two different stances on extraction in the same exact site and landscape, which is actually one of my field sites. On the left, you have Korea uh, uh, with um, some of his cabinet members and, and the media looking at a, a site that was slated uh, for, for, for a mining project. And on the right, a couple of years prior to that, you have protests at that same site against that particular mining project and also against the mining law that had just been passed, which I'll refer to later, um, later on in, in, in the talk. But just to kind of give you a visual of, of what these different stances look like, who was promoting them, and also the landscapes that were um, at stake. This dispute over resource extraction in Ecuador was a dispute between competing models of development that were articulated and then consolidated on the fly, echoing historic debates while also forging new interests and identities, resulting in a novel kind of political conflict. This dispute speaks to a key challenge of our global moment, the urgent need for development models that are both socially and environmentally sustainable and for political strategies to mobilize for this aspiration. As I'll discuss at the end of this talk, this challenge is only intensified by the accelerating climate crisis. Leftist administrations in Latin America are ideal sites to explore these challenges, since both policymakers and movements politicized and radicalized the relationship between development and extraction. In the process, they raise deep questions about the state, democracy, and the ecological foundations of global capitalism. Within this broad regional context, Ecuador is a particularly interesting site. It is one of the most commodity dependent economies on the continent and saw intense conflict between a leftist government committed to extractive development and an array of movements opposed to extraction in all forms. In this talk, I'll delve a bit into my book's arguments and I'll also offer a critique of how the politics of extraction tend to be depicted in social science research, policy conversations, as well as the mainstream media. So on to my book. My book is animated by two questions. First, why did activists in Ecuador begin to resist what they called the extractive model or extractivism? And what were the political effects of anti-extractive protest? And I just wanna pause again and turn your attention to the photograph um, on the right, which is during a protest that I did participant observation during and protesters are holding a banner that says, Fuera mineras, which in, in Spanish and in English, that means mining companies get out, like get out of the country, get out of our territory, get out of this landscape. And the image I think is quite important. It's a skull uh, with um, two crossbones and the skull has a cap on that says a, a helmet on, I should say a mining helmet that says Kinross, which was the name of a mining company that was uh, interested in developing a project in Ecuador at the time, a Canadian mining company. And then the two bones are um, a mining pick uh, and shovel, right? So there's this equation, symbolic equation of mining and death, which gives you a sense of the militancy of, of uh, these environmental and indigenous movements. I argue that in answer to these questions, I argue that the militant discourse of anti-extractivism was the product of a critical juncture. This critical juncture was marked by leftist President Correa's inauguration, his, his, his ascension to power, the constituent assembly that rewrote the constitution and the administration's promotion of large scale mining, which was a new extractive sector in an already oil dependent country. Anti-extractivism, a product of these specific historic circumstances, fractured the leftist coalition. It drove a wedge between Korea and his erstwhile movement allies and caused conflict within the state itself, among state bureaucrats with different visions of extraction. 
In what follows, I'll walk us through this argument and, and specifically through some of the history that led to this dramatic dispute uh, between different leftists, between the leftist government and then leftist uh, social movement activists. Um, I will situate Ecuador a bit in global context, drawing out some of the motivations for my book and connecting it with maybe other examples that, that people are, are already aware of if they're not familiar with Ecuador. I'll say a bit about my research methods um, and the, the interviews and ethnography that I conducted. And then with that in place, I'll walk us through my book's argument and also my critique of what scholars refer to as the resource curse. So I'll critique some of the predominant ways that resource extraction is studied in the social sciences. To conclude, I'll bring us a bit up to the present and, and mention a little bit about my current research, which, which dovetails a bit with this project, but takes it to a new extractive sector. So first, the motivations and the global context. What does protest against extraction in Ecuador tell us about broader global dynamics? So first, around the world, the extractive frontier is expanding to new territories. In Latin America, between 2000 and 2014, during that commodity boom, there was an intensification of extraction, especially in the Andes, the, the mountain range that sort of cuts through the middle of the continent, and the Amazon, one of the most important tropical forests in the world in terms of its, its, um, its, its, uh, its biodiversity and also its role in, in, um, in maintaining uh, the climate. So closer to home uh, here in the US, the advent of fracking for oil and natural gas has transformed the landscapes of the Northeast and Great Plains. So we are actually quite familiar with this expanding extractive frontier uh, here in the United States. Several recent studies have noted an important shift in the contention that surrounds the exploitation of these resources. Historically, a lot of conflict would focus on issues such as labor or ownership. But more recently, resistance to extraction has centered increasingly on environmental or cultural concerns and invokes new international rights and legal norms that protect local communities. Anti-extractive protests in Ecuador is emblematic of this broader shift. What's really important is that it emerged in response to the government and corporate attempt to develop a new extractive sector. So it's very much in response to the expansion, territorial um, expansion of extractive um, uh, activity. And in particular, I'm talking about large scale mining, which has a really large land footprint and, and environmental consequences. The eruption of militant protest against the expansion of extraction highlights dramatic changes in the political economy of extraction across the region. So I was just kind of reviewing some of the global context. Now I'm gonna to go to the regional context. The global commodity boom, as I mentioned, resulted in a substantial economic reorientation in Latin America. But even within this regional context, Ecuador stood out as one of the most resource dependent economies on the continent. So this graph, which is from 2010 or uh, 2009, sorry, or 2010, yeah, uh, from sort of the height of the commodity boom, though it lasted for a few more years, gives you a sense of how much of Latin America's export basket was composed of primary commodities. Those are commodities that don't require uh, processing or industrialization. It can be anything from oil to fruit um, uh, to sh farm shrimp uh, to mining or minerals, right? So Latin America is very resource dependent. South America within Latin America, so excluding Central America and the Caribbean is even more resource dependent. And Ecuador is one of the most resource dependent um, in terms of its exports um, in, in the whole region. And in particular, the Korea government, which governed for a decade from 2007 to 2017, benefited more from oil price increases than any other prior administration since the country was democratized in 1979. While Korea was in, in power, oil revenues financed over a third of the state budget. But even before the 2014 crash in oil prices, social spending already outpaced these revenues. Meanwhile, most of Ecuador's mineral, its gold and copper reserves remained unexploited and the prices for metals were historically high. So it was in this context that the Korea administration pursued large scale mining as a new source of state income and in his view as a means of bringing development to local communities in the Amazon and Southern Sierra where the metals are located underground. With two such contracts for large scale mining uh, in effect, the era of, of large scale mining has now been inaugurated in, in Ecuador. Social movements, however, consistently resisted Korea's attempts to expand extraction. These movements included the national and regional indigenous federations, which in the 1990s were considered by scholars to be among the most highly mobilized movements in the entire hemisphere. Um, and indeed, indigenous mobilization was key in the trajectory 
that brought a leftist government to power in the first place. But once his extractive commitments became clear, Korea became a target of indigenous protests, oftentimes in alliance with local anti-mining and anti-oil groups and community water associations. Militant environmental organizations based in urban areas were also part of the anti-extractive coalition, and they helped radicalize envir the environmental discourse of, of, of Ecuadorian activists. Um, so before presenting that, that historic narrative and, and my sort of argument that I, that I gave you a little snapshot of at the, at the beginning, let me just say a few words um, about my methodology. Um, my methods are qualitative. I spent 15 months in Ecuador uh, conducting a multi-sided ethnography. I'll show you the, the sites in a moment. I conducted lots of interviews with activists, but also with people in the corporate sector and in different state agencies. I um, did participant observation of lots of events and one of the most important of those uh, was a 700 kilometer long protest that started in the southern Amazon and marched all the way to the capital. Um, and that, that took two weeks. And, and so that was like a really interesting kind of ethnographic uh, uh, period of observation. But I observed lots of other types of events, including state and industry events. My field work took place primarily in three research sites. So that's a little map of, of Ecuador, which is, by the way, roughly about the size of Colorado, um, which I think kind of underlines how amazing the biodiversity and the landscape diversity is, given what a small um, uh, geographic area it is. So in the northern highlands and the northern Andean region is, is the capital, Quito. That's obviously a center of policymaking and corporate headquarters, but also the headquarters for national social movements. Then we have these two different sites at the bottom um, at, in the province of Asuay and the province of Zamora Chinchipe, uh, which were sites of planned mining projects. What's interesting is that these two sites show you the whole range of possible outcomes. On the, the little box on, on the left, which shows you a protest against a mine in Asuay, that's actually the same mine that I, uh, planned mine that I showed you photographs of earlier. That mine still hasn't been developed. That landscape looks exactly the same as the one that I showed you earlier. Um, whereas on the right, um, the, the province that borders Peru in the southern Amazon, that mine is now in production. That has a large scale contract with a um, Chinese owned st uh, consortium of, of state companies. So th that gives you kind of a range of, of where different projects are at in the country. So to understand the historic roots and the novelty of anti-extractive movements, my narrative in my book begins in the prior political period. So before the emergence of this anti-extractive, you know, fully consolidated anti-extractive movements. For the decade and a half of social mobilization that began with Ecuador's first national indigenous uprising in 1990, indigenous activists, often in coalition with other popular sector groups, identified neoliberalism as the target of their resistance. In their struggle against neoliberalism, these groups asserted that natural resources such as oil were the collective property of the people. They claimed to defend sovereignty and life itself against the private and often foreign appropriation of national wealth. So for example, during massive protests against neoliberal reforms in 1994, the National Indigenous Federation, the CONAI, called for non-renewable and subsoil resources, in other words, oil and minerals, to be the property of the plurinational state that they wanted to uh, bring into existence. Four years later, in their proposal for the 1998 constitution, the same federation stated that oil and mining should be national property. Thus, during these years of intense protests against cuts to public spending, privatization, and other neoliberal reforms, the National Indigenous Federation, which was a key protagonist in a broader protest movement, demanded the nationalization of natural resources for the collective benefit of the people. This is what I call radical resource nationalism. This vision of resources has a long history in Latin America. Throughout the 20th century and to the present, leftist movements have seen extraction, the problems with extraction, through the lens of anti-imperialism and concomitantly rejected foreign ownership and demanded national resource sovereignty. Korea entered the 2006 presidential race riding the coattails of these mass mobilizations, capitalizing on his already established anti-neoliberal credentials. Korea had served as a finance minister in a previous government and was well known as, as a prominent leftist economist. But with his rise to power, indigenous movements and their allies abandoned their prior resource nationalist stance. They rearticulated their position as the total opposition to resource extraction, away from their earlier nationalist rhetoric of resources for the people. 
So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a taste of what this anti-extractive discourse and tactics kind of look like. So first, in July of 2010, I spoke to a prominent member of a human rights organization that focuses on environmental conflict. She told me that, quote, extractivismo, extractivism, was to blame for a wide range of problems in Ecuador. She discussed how the sale of land to oil and mineral companies and the construction of infrastructure results in what she called a new colonization of the countryside. But she also observed that the expansion of extractive front activity opened up new possibilities for collective action, such as emergent alliances between indigenous groups and small farmers who may not be indigenous necessarily, mestizo farmers, um, in the Southern Amazon, who saw a common enemy in the advancing extractive frontier. I wanna note right away though, that this discourse, though it originated from social movements, was not restricted to social movements. It also circulated among actors that I call in my book, quote, critical bureaucrats. These were members of the administration who were hesitant, critical, or even opposition to more resource extraction. So a week after I spoke to that human rights activist, I sat down with a legislative advisor to Alianza País, Korea's own political party, who was later appointed to the Ministry of Economic Policy, so a pretty high ranking official in the party and in the state. This, um, uh, this advisor spoke to me of two grand projects in contradiction. On one side is the development model that was promoted by the government and in particular by Korea, based on what this advisor called, quote, the super exploitation of nature and extractivism. He explicitly contrasted this model with buen vivir, the indigenous concept of living well, now enshrined in the constitution, a model he saw as not so much economic as civilizational, that envisions a total reordering of the relationships between individual, community, and nature. So I wanna repose my research questions now that we have a taste of this discourse and how it represented a shift from the prior resource nationalist stance. Why did activists resist resource policy in these new terms and what were the political consequences? So as I mentioned earlier, there was a critical juncture, a context in which a lot of things were changing. Um, first was the inauguration of Ecuador's first democratically elect elected leftist president, and then the rewriting of the constitution. These two provided a political opening for the emergence of anti-extractive movements. In a national referendum in 2007, Ecuador's vote, Ecuadorians voted overwhelmingly in favor of convening an assembly to rewrite the constitution. Correa's party, Alianza País, won almost two thirds of the seats. During the assembly, some Alianza País delegates, members of other left-wing parties, including the indigenous party and their movement allies began to craft a vision of anti-extractivism. This framing drew on radical environmentalist proposals dating to the 1990s, indigenous discourses about territorial sovereignty and collective rights, and emerging environmentalist critiques of Latin America's pink tide governments. The definition that these activists of, uh, use to define extractivism varies, but to put it simply, a common thread is an export-led model of accumulation, an export-led model of development based on the intensive extraction and harvesting of natural resources with little or no industrialization. Anti-extractive activists claim that this model contaminates ecosystems, centralizes political power, undermines democracy, and violates constitutional rights. But Korea's rise to power and the rewriting of the constitution were not sufficient conditions to consolidate anti-extractivism as the critical discourse. Something else was important. I argued that it was the promotion of a new extractive sector of large-scale mining. Large-scale mining was a centerpiece of Korea's economic agenda in the context of booming international prices for largely untapped national reserves of gold and copper. Korea looked to this new sector to boost state revenue and underwrite the public investment in social services and infrastructure that already outpaced oil revenues, substantial as they were. But despite these potential benefits, large-scale mining and especially open pit mining in sensitive ecosystems such as the Amazon entails dire consequences for directly affected communities and the environment. Moreover, the energy and transportation infrastructure that mining requires contributes to deforestation and in turn climate change. As a result, both promoters and detractors saw mining as a path to be taken or avoided at all costs. From the administration's perspective, mining would help alleviate poverty. From, for anti-extractive activists, it would further entrench economic dependency, territorial dispossession, and environmental degradation. For both sides then, 
an entire model of development was at stake. The 2009 mining law was the first in a series of pro-mining reforms. The protests that it occasioned, organized by a nascent coalition of the national and regional indigenous federations, radical environmentalists, and local anti-mining groups were the first inkling of the coming political realignment. During these protests, a press release circulated by the Highland Indigenous Federation, which had played a key role in mobilizing against neoliberalism in the 1990s and calling for resource nationalism, highlighted the new salience of an anti-extractive framing. So I'm gonna put this quote up and, and also read it. Overcoming the neoliberal model cannot be achieved with the policies of a developmentalist and extractivist model that promotes the extraction of economic resources at whatever cost and reproduces the socioeconomic structure of inequality, injustice, discrimination, and the exploitation of human beings and nature. In the context of a leftist administration, anti-neoliberal discourse, which had been completely salient in the prior period among activists, lost some of its critical traction. The government itself identified as post or anti-neoliberal. Activists in this context crafted a new language of contention focused on what they began to call the extractive model. So throughout my field work, I saw that this new anti-extractive discourse circulated widely in activist networks at events, in meetings, and in media. In these venues, activists stri crafted strikingly similar narratives. So for example, at an event organized by anti-mining activists in the province of Asuay, one of my field sites, Alberto Acosta, who had served as Minister of Energy and Mines and the president of the Constituent Assembly under the Korea government. So again, another high ranking official in the government, but left the government due to disagreements over extraction, called extractivism the quote, essence of development, which he understood as a 500 year long history of the imposition of Western modernity. From his perspective, overcoming extraction entails an entirely new model of accumulation. A member of a radical environmental group, Acción Ecológica, presented a very similar account during a public debate over mining in the Northern Highland province of Imbabura. She used the opportunity to delve into a sweeping history of extractivismo, dating it to 1534, the year of the Spanish conquest of Quito and what she called the moment of insertion into the world market. But even within these sweeping 500 year long accounts for anti-extractive activists, the Correa administration stood out as the most extractivist regime in Ecuador's history, in large part due to the promotion of large scale mining. As conflict over extraction intensified, anti-extractivism became the language of contention, guiding movement and state strategy. It circulated in symbiotic relationship with the administration's unrelenting push for new extractive projects. Each node in the extractive model constituted a potential target of mobilization. So protest was as likely to erupt in the streets of Quito at a state ministry or corporate headquarters as it was in the immediate sites of mineral and oil extraction. Anti-extractive movements forced the Korea administration to explicitly defend extraction. And here are just some quotes, a kind of a sense of, of how Korea would defend it. And this often happened in his weekly presidential addresses, which were several hours long and broadcast on TV and on the radio. So throughout his administration and often in direct response to episodes of protests, Korea asserted that resource extraction is good for development and democracy because the revenues it generates benefit the majority of the population, including the communities most affected by its socio-environmental consequences. Interestingly, he in effect redeployed social movements prior resource nationalism framing by arguing that resource extraction should benefit the people. And his administration put this into practice, directing the proceeds from royalties and taxes to fund infrastructure and social services. During his time in office, poverty dropped dramatically from 37 to 23%. But in Ecuador, from the moment they emerged, anti-extractive movements also caused conflict within the state. So Correa's position wasn't necessarily the position of all state officials. Official resource policy became a field of contention between bureaucrats with distinct political visions. After the Constituent Assembly, officials with anti-extractivist sympathies, such as Alberto Acosta, who I mentioned, left the regime and opposition politicians began to identify as anti-mining and anti-oil. So extractivism had really polarized the political landscape. 
And so by the time I conducted field work, this discourse circulated beyond social movement activists. Bureaucrats tasked with long-term economic planning that were still employed by the state um, and working for the state claimed to me in interviews that a post-extractive economy, an imagined future in which Ecuador is no longer economically dependent on primary commodities, provided a solution to persistent underdevelopment and ongoing socio-environmental conflict. Somewhat counterintuitively, they justified the expansion of extraction in the present in terms of the revenues that would generate to transform the economy in the future. Large-scale mining, a sector still then in its early stages of construction, was to be the beginning of an end, a quote, post-oil vision, as one bureaucrat told me, or as another official phrased it, the last moment of extraction. At the same time, bureaucrats more directly involved with negotiating with foreign firms and attracting foreign investment were forced to respond to both anti-extractive activists and their more skeptical colleagues while still attracting that investment in the mining sector. Korea, as I mentioned, was one of the foremost defenders of extraction. Uh, he branded activists as infants and traitors, accused them of terrorism, and this resulted in legal action against nearly 200 indigenous and environmental activists. At the very end of his last term in office, he deployed military and police force against indigenous communities who protested their displacement by another Chinese-owned mining project. So at this juncture, I want to highlight a little bit the differences between my approach to extraction and the prevailing approach, which is this idea of a resource curse, which prevails not only in social science and the academy, but also in public policy work and in media conversations. According to the quote resource curse, states that depend on oil or mining for their revenues are likely to be authoritarian and economically unstable or underdeveloped. From this perspective, oil or mining rents, which are taxes and royalties charged to um, extractive firms, are the glue that holds elite coalitions together, enabling them to buy off or repress civil society, thus insulating them from popular pressure. The result is either low quality democracies or stable autocracies. In contrast to resource curse arguments, my book demonstrates that oil and mining don't homogeneously or unilaterally determine political outcomes. Instead, the consequences of extraction are highly context dependent and the interests of different actors shouldn't be assumed in advance. In Ecuador, as another commodity dependent left populist governments in the region, resource revenues were a double-edged sword. In the short term, they enabled administrations like the Korea government to govern from the left, buoying high approval ratings and electoral victories and resulting in important reductions in poverty and inequality. But in the longer term, by locking in an extractive model of development, they undermined broader social and economic transformations and also drove a wedge between the government and some of their former political allies. Also, in sharp contrast to the depiction of civil society in this scholarship, in my view, indigenous labor, peasant, and environmental activists are not just passive recipients of oil spending or victims of state repression. Instead, they are protagonists. They articulated novel critiques of extraction and opened up new arenas of conflict, both between movements and the state and even within the state itself. As a result, activists and even some bureaucrats rejected an extractive model of development altogether, an outcome that would be actually inexplicable within the resource curse framework, which assumes that especially elite actors will always want to continue um, uh, extractive activity because of the ways that they benefit from it. Defying simplistic analyses of civil society and oil and mining dependent states, anti-extractive movements in Ecuador were creative, working through and against institutions to achieve their goals. They elected anti-extractive leaders to local government. They marched from the Amazon to the capital. They organized nature walks through the still verdant sites slated for extractive ruin and occupied mining camps erected on their dispossessed land. They monitored environmental impacts and frustrated with the legal system, they took the enforcement of constitutional rights into their own hands, organizing the very consultations in local communities affected by extractive projects that the government had failed to implement. These tactics had a deep impact on politics in Ecuador and beyond. The national territory and the resources it contains literally constitute the foundation of the state. 
In resisting ex the extraction of resources, indigenous and environmental movements across the Americas called into question the taken for granted relationship between state, nation, territory, and resources. To conclude, I'll note that although my book stretches from 2007 to 2017, these topics have only grown in relevance as new forms of extraction take hold around the planet um, and climate change, of course, threatens communities, territories, and ecosystems. Currently, my research focuses on the extractive frontiers of green technologies, specifically lithium batteries and electric vehicles, which I'm happy to discuss. I've done some field work on lithium extraction in Chile. Finally, I'd like to pivot to the future of radical and left politics in the region. Given the fact that during the pink tide, the Ecuadorian left fractured, pinning movements against a government that they had initially, if critically, supported, I want to highlight the necessity of both left governments and left movements. For the foreseeable future, achieving socioeconomic equality on a livable planet is the key political task for the hemisphere and the globe. For all the limitations and contradictions of the pink tide, without progressives in power, political, social, and economic inequalities reinforce one another and deny a dignified life to the vast majority. And for all the challenges of sustaining anti-extractive movements, resistance against extractive projects is vital in order to, to avert the worst of climate chaos. Despite the potential for conflict between them, these two projects of progressives in government and leftist movements are fundamentally intertwined. So what is the possibility of Latin American leftists reconstructing coalitions that can weave together egalitarian and ecological demands? The future, it's cliche to say, is more unpredictable by the day. But there are new policy paradigms, um, such as uh, the call for a new eco-social pact and the framework of Our Green America, which I can talk about. Um, these are different policy frameworks, articulate an inspiring vision for a green and socially just regional economy. Thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Thea. Um, it's amazing how you were able to pull together in a relatively short period of time the very complex and nuanced arguments that you have in the book. I can, you know, quick book promo, can't under recommend this book uh, or can't over recommend this book, in fact. Um, so for people who have questions, please throw them up into the Q&A. Um, and uh, wondering if I could just start off at some level kind of where you ended. Um, one of the things that I really appreciated um, at the end of the book was your discussion of kind of the existential dilemmas facing on the one hand, a kind of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, nationalist extractivist resource uh, radical approach versus the anti-extractive, particularly because Korea, as you discuss, came to power in part on the back of social movements who subsequently were central to the anti-extractivist agenda. So I guess I was curious if you could talk a little bit about, um, I, I felt kind of teased at the end of the book where you're saying, what would be great and, and kind of the failures of the anti-extractivist mobilization was that they were very strong on kind of demands around democracy and community participation and informed consent, but kind of lacked an alternative transformational national economic vision, right? That there was nothing. So if you weren't going to get growth versus from extractivism, what was your kind of alternative and anti-extractivists as a whole didn't really seem to have that. So I'm wondering what, what are the pathways then out of this dilemma um, that would offer something more substantial in terms of an alternative vision that's not just in the fevered imaginations of left intellectuals, but actually is aligned with actually existing social forces that could bring it into being. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great, great question and a big one. Um, so I'm going to try to restrain myself to not sort of go in too many directions with it. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the pandemic, the economic consequences of the pandemic, and also the neoliberal turn of the current government, who people thought was going to maybe be a continuation of Korea, but actually went to his right. Uh, this is a former Lenin Moreno, the current president, who's a former vice president of Korea's. Um, so you have like a more neoliberal government, and then you have this extreme 
public health and economic devastation. And it, and it can't be overstated like how much Latin America is probably the region of the world that has suffered the most from, from the pandemic and, and, and the economic fallout of it. So these are our circumstances that I think in some ways help create the conditions of a broader popular coalition and in other ways make it hard, right? And so I just wanna speak a little bit to that um, uh, and then I'll see if I've sort of answered your question. So I think the ways that they create those conditions is that it was in the 1990s and early 2000s under neoliberal governments um, whose policies harmed a really broad array of, of constituencies, right? So working class and lower class and poor people, but also like lower middle class, middle class people really kind of all saw like a common problem with um, these neoliberal policies that really reduced state spending, um, had underinvestment in public infrastructure, just, you know, harmed lots of different folks across the board. And it was in that context that the indigenous movement, but with a lot of different allies and other popular movements was able to create this really broad social um, protest that, that eventually in a way, you know, resulted in, in, in Korea's election. Um, and in some ways, those conditions repeat a little bit now because you have a sort of neoliberal, um, those technically left, but really in policy practice, neoliberal government. And we saw the implications of this last year um, in October of 2019, when there was a massive, massive social movement that erupted in Ecuador, again, led with the indigenous movement, but with a really broad sector of society involved. And there were like 10 or 12 days of intense protest against basically austerity policies um, that, the, that the Moreno government had put into place in order to satisfy the IMF because the Moreno government had an IMF uh, loan agreement. Um, and they forced them to walk back. They forced this, the government to concede these popular demands. So it was this interesting moment of like the rearticulation of a really broad protest movement around like sort of bread and butter economic issues that, that harmed a lot of people. On the other hand, as we know, you know, around the world, it's challenging to organize during a pandemic and when people are experiencing a level of economic immiseration that is just hard to express. In, in Latin America, um, uh, in some countries, 40, 50, 60% of people work in the informal economy, which means they just have zero social safety net um, whenever you know, the economy goes into a downturn. And it's, it's just really devastating. We're seeing the return of forms of hunger and malnutrition and chronic poverty that some of these left governments had actually done a lot to, to, to reduce when they were in power. So it's very challenging conditions to organize, but I do think that what the moment has shown is like, you know, the deep inadequacy of, of neoliberal um, or, or conservative approaches to the pandemic and to the health system and to economic support. And so there is the potential for like rearticulating that coalition. I'll, I'll sort of leave it there, but it's, it's a great question. That's great. I mean, perhaps we can pick up one of the themes from that. So Ecuador is going to be having an election on Sunday. How do you see these kinds of issues playing itself out in the context of the current election? Yeah, it's it's amazing. I saw that question in the chat and I was glad someone asked it because like more than I would have predicted what my the conflicts my book discusses are front and center in the election and the re and like really much more than I would have predicted them to be. Um, the, the reason I say that is that we have two different leftists on the on the ballot. So we have a right wing or conservative person who's run before and lost before Guillermo Lasso. He's like a banker and a businessman. So that's him. And then we have a candidate that is associated with Korea and Alianza País, though the, the party name has changed, um, um, Andres Arauz. And then we have a candidate that's associated very deeply and actually makes quite a number of appearances in my book associated with the anti-extractive left, Yaku Perez. Um, he was, his name was Carlos Perez when I spoke to him in, in you know, so just in case people search for it in the book, um, but I talk a little bit about why he changed his name to an indigenous name. Anyhow, so we have like the anti-extractive left, the kind of Koreista or, you know, more like a progressive kind of um, technocratic kind of left. And then we have a right-wing person, right? So it will be interesting. I'm not sure I would have to get into the weeds of like, um, you know, uh, polling data and stuff like that. If the, these two leftisms that are in my book and on the ballot are like splitting the left vote or 
possibly because I've this I've noticed in prior you know polling and and, and voting trends in, in over the past several years in Ecuador, it's possible that Yaku Perez, the anti-extractivist running, is getting votes that are disaffected enough from Correismo that they wouldn't have voted for him at all, right? So he's not really splitting the left. Maybe he's expanding a little bit the you know who's turning out. I I don't know which way it goes, and I think there are other people more informed about this current electoral dynamics to answer that. But it but basically anti-extractivism versus something like you know, resource nationalism or progressive kind of, uh, but 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 uh, um, development approach to, to resource extraction are both on the ticket right now. So I'm curious to see how it turns out. Great. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit, you know, we have a new administration in the United States, uh, you know, arguably one of the one of the elements that contributed arguably to, to the success of uh, the experiments in, of the pink tide was that in the early part of this century, the US was like focused on the Middle East and focused on kind of the war on terror and was not as engaged in as its commonly historical intervention as commonly engaged historically in its interventions in Latin America. Um, and so there was, there seemed to be a little bit more space for those kinds of experiments um, than perhaps it existed certainly in the 50s and 60s. Um, what do you what do you kind of see as the the role that the Biden administration might be taking towards um, Latin America kind of in general or efforts to kind of pursue heterodox uh, development strategies? Yeah, that is um that is an excellent question. And I think one that will kind of kind of have to say time will tell because I think the experience of the Obama administration is very mixed on a foreign policy mm -hmm. standpoint, you know, I, there are there are some you know certainly some negatives in terms of foreign intervention in conflicts around the world that occurred on the Obama administration and I'm not exactly clear how much Biden has like learned from that or will change his tack um, that that issue aside um, definitely there is a relief on the part of Latin American progressives and leftists that Trump is out of office obviously Trump um, uh, in very concrete ways like helped um, increase the political fortunes of very right-wing political actors in, in, in the Americas, right? Bolsonaro being one of them, but also his work with sort of fringe, very right-wing elements of the Venezuelan opposition and his attempt to like elevate, you know, some of those to, to, to power um, and, and working around more um, um, dialogue based forms of, 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 of moderating conflicts, you know, it, it, it was very concerning and having Trump out of the office means that re, you know, kind of right wing and fascist and conservative elements around the region, like don't have someone in the White House that's going to like elevate their fortunes. Um, but, you know, I'm very curious to see what Biden does. He has said one thing that is positive from my perspective, but I really just want to frame all this by saying I'm not exactly sure what what policy framework he'll take towards the 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 Americas and Democrat Democrats in office in the White House have done lots of not good things in the Americas right so I think the standard is pretty low unfortunately he has said that he wants to address root causes of migration so he wants to address things like climate change and economic disparities and underdevelopment and vulnerabilities that are driving migration and that he also wants to uh, uh, help invest through, I don't know if it would be through foreign aid or through what exactly, um, in green technology and renewable energy in the region, right? So sort of offer this alternative pathway that could be an alternative to the sort of oil and, 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 and mineral and large scale agriculture perhaps based economies that predominate in the region. So we'll see if he carries through on that promise. I think that, you know, thinking about the redistribution of economic resources in the region, uh, region including the US is, is, is really important. I also think this would be more radical than Biden is gonna do, but if I were president, you know, one thing that I think is really important to talk about is canceling debt and I, and I don't mean student debt, though I think we should cancel that too, but what I mean is sovereign debt, which is the debt that, that governments owe to often either private creditors or international financial institutions like the IMF. And Latin America is awash in sovereign debt to levels that I think all economists agree like are just totally unsustainable and never be paid off. 
the issue with debt, and I'll end this here, is that debt kind of incentivizes extractivism in a number of ways. But one key way is that if you have a lot of debt, you're going to go to where you can immediately get government revenues. And that's these extractive, you know, these global markets and extractive resources. And so it really creates a short termism in terms of economic policy. And so Biden could do a lot. The U.S. has a lot of leverage over international debt markets and over international financial institutions. Um, I don't think he would take such a radical step, but I would love to see him do it. So to pick up on this, the 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 last point, um, and try to link uh, the discussion you were just having with some of your more recent work, which I know is focused on kind of um, the political economy of kind of green value chains as it relates to kind of transforming uh, in a green fashion the kind of global economy. So if we if we take the kind of the green new deal, the global green new deal as a goal and objective. We're going to have to have renewable forms of energy that's going to involve a lot of things, including uh, the use of things like lithium and other kind of metals that we can at this point only get by mining. So how do we, it's already hard enough to come up with like a heterodox development strategy. How do we think about doing that in the context of um, uh, trying to think about you know, the negative effects of extractivism when some of those resources may in fact be central to the construction of some kind of a, of a new type of, of green economy. And so how does one manage those conflicts? I, I think there would be a wing of folks who maybe come out of the degrowth community who would say, you know, we just, that's too bad. That's not a pathway that we can go down. And so it's about degrowth and lowering consumption and so forth. What what is kind of the positive vision of building a, a, a green economy that would still rely at, to some degree on extractive minerals? Yeah, thank you. Amazing question and, and nice framing in terms of yes, there's a lot of different perspectives of, on this among progressives, among leftists, and then you know more broadly than that. Just to, to give folks a little context if people are not kind of aware of, of the, the bigger context to John's question. Um, green technologies or clean technologies are the technologies that we need to develop and deploy to switch to renewable energy and also to mitigate you know, the, the, uh, the, the harm that climate change has already caused, right? And so we're thinking about things like solar panels, like wind turbines. Um, there are also more um, speculative technologies around carbon capture and things like that. And, and what I'm studying is lithium batteries, which are in your cell phones and your laptops, but are also in Teslas, right? And so those are used, a lot of what drives the demand for lithium batteries increasingly is electric vehicles. They're also used to store electric, excuse me, renewable energy on grids that use solar or wind power because the energy is intermittent, so you need to store it in some way. Okay, so those are what lithium ion batteries are. Now the word lithium gives you a clue that um, like anything in the world and like all green technologies, these are made with things that are pulled out of the earth, right? And so what's being pulled out of the earth here is lithium, but there's also cobalt and nickel and magnesium and a whole host of other minerals that go into making these batteries. Um, and just to give you a sense of how significant John's question is and, and the sort of topic, uh, right now investor analysts are predicting a new huge commodity boom right i talked about a commodity boom from 2000 to 2014 and i gave you a sense of how much that changed the global and regional conjuncture right right now we might be entering into another commodity boom because the amount of raw materials that green technologies require is actually enormous right so just to give you an example a tesla or a, i don't need to say a tesla any electric vehicle like sedan size has like 180 pounds of copper in it which is like way more copper that's wiring you know for all of the uh, you know the electric motor and 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 driver so these are resource intensive objects, even if they are extremely important to reducing carbon emissions. And so it feels like a real trade off, like how do we both protect local ecosystems, um, uh, respect indigenous rights, um, uh, and also uh, transition to a future in which these green technologies will be more prevalent. And it's, it's you know a thorny one, and I'm at the beginning stages of a project around this. I've done a few months of field work in Chile, uh, when I, lucky enough when I did field work before the pandemic, um, you know, and so I've been and reading and, and sort of researching this question. And I think there's you know a few ways that I would answer it really briefly. One is I think that we need to really rethink um, global economic exchange, specifically trade, right? So what are the conditions under which lithium or cobalt or copper are extracted and then traded around the globe, right? 
are there ways, the answer is yes, <laughs> are there ways to make these much more just, equitable, environmentally sustainable? Our current trade model, so-called free trade, I don't really like the term, it's not really free for anybody except for capital mobility and investor kind of rights. And so thinking about how to rewrite our trade models to make them more green, lower carbon and more just and to ensure um, better sourcing and better conditions for communities and ecosystems at the extractive frontiers of these supply chains, right? So that's one. Um, another though, and this is the bigger thing that, that John, the end of John's question kind of hinted towards is like rethinking a lot about how we produce and consume, right? And I'll just give a quick example and end here, which is like, you know, for me, this whole moment of electrifying transit, of, of moving away from internal combustion engines towards electric transit is a moment to actually rethink our whole transit system. Like, why do we each need a car? Um, uh, why don't we push our transit systems towards mass transit, public transit, um, walking and cycling um, uh, and other forms of transit? Because the most resource intensive thing in terms of the minerals pulled out of the ground is a model in which everyone has their own passenger vehicle that just sits in a garage most of the day and you know isn't even really being used in any rational sense in terms of how much went into it. Whereas a bus at least serves many more people, right? And so just thinking about how do we design these transit models and what kind of transit systems do we demand in the global north so that the supply chains are less rapacious in terms of how much needs to be extracted. Um, and I'll, I'll just pause there because I could go on. This is like the question of our moment, but I just encourage folks when we're, when we're advocating for environmental low carbon you know, policies in the US as I do to just think about their supply chain implications because I think different policies have really different uh reverberate in really different ways across the rest of the planet so i i draw one last question the draw from the from once something submitted to the q a so you focused primarily on ecuador these kind of issues have also been raised in similar debates in bolivia there was the recent relatively recent legislation in el salvador about ending um, minerals so what kind of path do you see there being a pathway uh, the, Q, the, the questioner says, you know, what about Costa Rica? Ecotourism, agriculture, those are themes that kind of Yaku Perez has drawn on as what uh, we might think of as a, maybe as a degrowth approach or a Buen Vivir approach. You know, is that, is that really a viable strategy as an alternative pathway for sustainable prosperity? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that from the US to Ecuador, we should be thinking of ways to shift our economies to less resource intensive, less energy intensive, to thinking about care as one of the most important social functions, right? Whether that's teaching or healthcare or elder care, which happens to be low resource intensive and low carbon, right? And so thinking about those sectors of our economy, also thinking more broadly about care sectors, including environmental care, environmental remediation. And then there's the whole renewable energy kind of sector that we need to build up, right? So there's a lot of different sectors that I think that they don't have zero environmental implications, but they have fewer and they might also create better and more equitable social relations, right? So I'm all for wherever we are in the world of, of thinking about, you know, how to build a different economic model. And I think, you know, honestly, as challenging as the circumstances are right now for all the reasons I listed earlier with the pandemic and economic dislocation, crises are also potential moments to sort of do deeper reevaluation and to maybe create different types of coalitions. Um, you know, one, one thing I'll just to circle back to your, to your question more specifically, I mean, I think that all of those ideas about, you know, more regenerative agriculture, ecotourism, though the flying thing is not so low carbon, but okay, a lot of ecotourism is actually regional. I mean, people within Ecuador might travel, drive and, you know, travel <coughs> somewhere within the country, right? So you have ecotourism, you have regenerative agriculture, you have a research and knowledge economy and a care economy, and all of those would be great. The, and I think they should be promoted. The problem is the economic resources needed to deal with, you know, extreme poverty, which has really increased, as, you know, in this pandemic moment. And in that context, I think the two things are key. One is domestic within a country and one is regional or global. So the domestic is we have to tax rich people more. Mm -hmm. We have to do that everywhere. But in Latin America, wealthy people are taxed at, or just everyone actually is taxed as way lower rates than is like, you know, the OECD average or whatever. So taxation rates are extremely low in Latin America. And that has to change because that's another thing that incentivizes extraction because you don't have domestic kind of fiscal resources. Um, that's, and they're more sustainable economically, I mean, more stable than, than boom and bust cycles of extractive markets. So that's one thing. And then the global, I already mentioned, 
mentioned, which is I think there has to be a real call on the World Bank, on the IMF and on private creditors to reduce dramatically, or in my view, cancel debt that is constraining fiscally the room for maneuver for progressive governments, right? So I don't think you can do these things just in one country, even though a country like Costa Rica has done amazing things towards decarbonization, right? But I think ultimately there are changes at higher scales that need to occur. And I think that's also where we come in in the global north in solidarity and sort of policy circles to kind of think about how can we put pressure on our governments or corporations to change that global picture. Well, thank you, Thea. Um, apologies, folks, for, for apologies to you for running over a little bit, and for thank you, folks, for hanging around with us. This was absolutely wonderful presentation. Uh, the book again, Resource Radicals, Duke University Press, um, and uh, we hope to have you back very soon, Thea. If that would be okay. Likewise, of course. Uh, maybe for the next project when I when I you know uh, whenever you want, um, that would be great. This wonderful questions. I I was reading some of them that we didn't get to, and very informed uh, discussion and questions. Thank you. Right. Uh, so, uh, all right, everyone, we will see you next week. We're back to our regular scheduled time of 1230. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you here next week. Take care, everyone. Thanks again, Thea. Thank you.